So hi, um, I'm Jessica Toothaker, and I'm a senior at Syracuse University. And today I'm going to tell you about the work I did this summer here in Dr. Updike's lab. And we're using a new genetic engineering technique called CRISPR to fluorescently tag germ cells in C. elegans. So first I want to take a second to tell you about cellular immortality. So in our bodies, we have two types of cells. The first are somatic cells, and the second are germ cells. Germ cells we deem are immortal because after fertilization, they pass their genetic information on and are able to differentiate into all the tissue types in our body. This then leads to the next generation. <laughs> so in the Updike Lab, we're interested in studying what components of these cells are responsible for this immortality, and also what components allow it to be conserved as these cells are passed through the generations. So why is this important? If a germ cell doesn't have the ability to differentiate into these cells, then an organism will be infertile. And if these properties are in cells that they shouldn't be, so somatic cells, then these cells will become cancerous. So in the Updike lab, we study germ cells in C. elegans. And C. elegans are microscopic nematodes that live in the soil. And we use them for two reasons. The first is that they're transparent, and the second is that they're hermaphroditic. So in one organism, we can trace all of germ cell development by simply looking around this gonad arm. The component of these germ cells that we're really interested in looking at are called P granules. And P granules are argonaut proteins. So argonaut proteins are involved in mRNA silencing. So in the nucleus, DNA is transcribed into mRNA. mRNA then leaves the nucleus through a nuclear pore to the cytoplasm where it's translated into proteins. But what P granules do is they're docked on the nucleus surrounding this nuclear pore so that if an mRNA signal that is not supposed to be in a germ cell passes through, the P granules can silence them. This is what keeps these germ cells from, from expressing somatic traits. In biology, when we want to study a protein component or cellular component such as P granules, we first need to be able to see them. So we do this by adding fluorescent proteins. In the past, there's been no way to edit endogenous genes in C. elegans, so we've had to inject plasmids carrying lots of genes to try to get fluorescent tagging on our proteins. But as I said before, germ cells are really good at silencing signals that shouldn't be there. So whenever we injected plasmids and they were transcribed into mRNA, they were long repetitive regions. And the germ cells could recognize these long repetitive regions and they silenced them before our proteins could be expressed. So as a result, we got really faint, not very good signaling in our worms. So my project this summer has, to been use a, has been to use a new technique to edit that endogenous gene. And this is called CRISPR. So CRISPR is a four-year-old technology, and it stands for clustered, regularly, interspaced, short, palindromic repeats. And CRISPR is derived from bacteria. So some bacteria, when a virus will infect the cell, the bacteria possess an enzyme called Cas9. Cas9 will then take this mRNA signal and chop it up. It will then replace these breaks with short repetitive nucleotide sequences, so that way the viral DNA is disrupted and the bacteria will not express the viral DNA and thus will not be infected. And so engineers have been able to take this bacterial defense mechanism and put it in multiple organisms. So this summer, I take my double-stranded endogenous DNA. The first thing that happens is a 20 nucleotide guide RNA binds to the site that I want to break. So this guide RNA is a map. And it's a map for the Cas9 enzyme. The Cas9 enzyme will then create a blunt double-stranded break. So now there's a hole in my DNA. And I can repair this hole with whatever inserts or sequences that I want. So now my endogenous gene will express traits that weren't normally there. The first way you can do this is called non-homologous end joining. And this basically means the host will take its own DNA repair machinery and just try to fix the break. So this is good for creating small mutations, such as one base pair deletions, additions, frame shift mutations. So this repair technique has a really high success rate. But you can't uh, really control and insert large pieces. So I'm using homology-directed repair. So this has a much lower success rate, but it allows for more complicated inserts. 
So what happens is a template strand is introduced to the break site, and the template is going to carry the genes that I want to insert. The template has two regions that correspond to either side of the break site. This means that when the repair template is introduced to the cell, it will be directed to the correct site to repair. So then the endogenous repair machinery again replaces the break, but this time it repairs it based on that template that was already provided. So this is what's on my template. And we're caught, we use a self-excising cassette. So on one end, I have my fluorescent protein marker. On the other end, I have a flag region, and this just allows for antibody staining in later studies. Two LOXP sites surround two general terminating sequences and two phenotypic markers. The first phenotypic marker is the squat one gene. This encodes for a rolling worm. The second selectable marker is hygromycin resistance. So if I add hygromycin to my worms with this insert, the only ones that survive are the ones that have this fix in their DNA. And the last and probably most important part of my cassette is this Cre recombinase. And this is an enzyme that when heat shocked, will take these two locks P sites and join them together. So the only thing left in my worms is the GFP marker, a LOX P site in an intron, so it's non-disruptive, and the three prime flag region. So the two genes that we want to do this to in the Updike lab are first pattern one. So this is a component that's in a P body. And a P body is really similar to a P granule, except it's in all cells and it's in the cytoplasm. So previous work in the lab has identified a P granule component that interacts with P bodies. So we want this strain so we can study that interaction more. The second gene we're interested in is called PERG1. And PERG1 is a component of the P granule itself. PERG1 is known to have an antagonistic relationship with another gene that we have a strain for. So we want this gene to study that relationship. So what did I actually do in the lab? So the first thing I had to do is I had to create plasmids that would carry all the components I wanted to insert into my worms. My first plasmid, which I'll call my breaking plasmid, carried that Cas9 enzyme and my guide sequence that I need to insert. My second plasmid, which I'll call my repair plasmid, contains all the components of that self-excising cassette, as well as four uh, sites that enzymes will cut this vector. After they cut this vector in a process called Gibson assembly, the flanking regions that surround each side of my template will be inserted in their place. And that looks like this. And then we grow these vectors in bacteria on ampicillin added plates. And this is so that only bacteria that got these inserts, because they have ampicillin resistance, will grow. So as you can see, we got good growth for all of our guide RNAs and all of our GFP. Originally, we wanted to do this process with red fluorescent protein, too, but we didn't seem to get any growth. So we wanted to figure out why that was happening. The first thing we did was we wanted to test those cut sites that I showed in the last picture. In our GFP, on our AVR2, we got four bands. So this means the plasmid was cut up into four different pieces. But in our RFP, our AVR2 only created one or maybe two cut sites. So that means something was wrong. So we had to sequence this. And what we found was that in our template plasmid, there was an eight base pair deletion, and it was right at the site of this cut site. So instead of making four different pieces with our plasmid, we were making one and a half, maybe. So at this point, we had to abandon our RFP and work forward with our GFP strains. So the next thing we have to do is we have to inject one millimeter worms under a microscope. And what we inject are both of our plasmids and a green pharynx marker so we can tell if our injections work. And we inject into the gonad arm, and this is where those germ cell stem cells reside. So after we inject, we look for the first of our two phenotypic markers, and that was that rolling phenotype. So on any plates that we saw rolling worms, we then needed to test our second phenotypic marker, which was the hygromycin resistance. So we added hygromycin, and this will kill off any worm that wasn't carrying our complete cassette. So this was most of the worms. But then, two or three days later, we would see worms with our glowing pharynx marker, and then also the rolling phenotype that survived. So in a few seconds, this worm will move backwards, and its entire body segment here is going to roll. 
And this is really different from a normal worm because those move just similar to like a snake when all of their body is on one plane. So we got these worms for two, or for one of our two genes. So our next steps is to try to get rollers in both of our strains. And once we have them, we need to make sure they're homozygous. So that way when we excise this cassette, we're only doing it in worms that have two copies of our CRISPR edits. So after those are heat shocked and allowed to grow for a couple days and we get our strains really going, we're gonna use these strains in future work. So for pattern one, if you remember, we're gonna to use to study the similarities and relationship between pea bodies and pea granules. Our PERG ones is we're gonna look at the antagonistic relationship with another pea granule component. And for the RFP strains that we couldn't get to work, we have to try a completely new tactic. So instead of taking one large plasmid with four cut sites, we're gonna to try to take three small plasmids, each carrying one flank or the cassette, and then merge those together so we have one plasmid that won't recombine and X out our enzyme cut site. And so with that, I'd like to thank my PI, Dr. Updike, the two lab techs in our lab, Catherine and Jesse, and the other undergrad Heath, who's gonna be giving a talk here in a few minutes. And I'd also like to thank the NSF and MDI Bio for funding this project. And with that, I'll take any questions. So his question is, why did we choose those two genes? So originally we had five genes that we wanted to work with, and three of them were gonna be with RFP. But those two genes specifically was because one paper out for review right now wanted to know the relationship between pea bodies and pea granules, so that's why we needed the PATR1 gene to study that relationship. And then PERG1, we wanna study because its antagonistic partner is Caesar1, which is a really hot pathway, and it's involved in a whole bunch of different processes. So PERG1, if it's expressed, Caesar1 won't be. So we wanna know what happens when we knock down PERG1 and there's too much of that Caesar1. I have kind of a question that's a little less scientific and a little more ethical in relation. Okay. The, the, the students this summer learned a lot about doing ethics in science, as you know. And, um, and I'm curious, you're using one of these very, very hot genetic engineering methods, like state-of-the-art science right now. And there might be people in the audience who wonder about genetically engineering organisms. Um, you've worked with a, a nematode, a microscopic worm in your study, um, but the use of that technology could eventually be applicable to people. Do you see any kind of a concern with that, do you, having done the science, feel concerned about that in any way? Well, I know CRISPR's been used for a lot of different things, such as knocking down genes or overexpressing genes. The work I'm doing isn't really modifying the actual function of genes, and it's just allowing us a better way to see them. So I don't really see a concern in trying to better to see them, but there's definitely a lot of potential for controversy and ethical issues with this type of technology. Any other questions? We have a few minutes. Yeah. If you had one experiment that you would really wish would work, what would be the next one you want to get to go? Uh, if I had one experiment that I wish would work, um, I think I really, really wish that I could get um, those rollers to homozygous so I could heat shock them. So then I could see the gene, not j the GFP, not just in the pharynx, but actually in the region that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. So it's cool to see success of my injections, but it'd be nice to see success of the entire thing. So his question is, what is actually happening with that rolling phenotype? And I am not sure of the specifics behind that, but it's a really good question. That's probably one I should know the answer to. <laughs> yeah. So let's say that you, um, that you got those rollers, and, they, um, and you crossed them, you got homozygosity, uh, and now you had fluorescence in the pea granules like you were looking for. Mm -hmm. What hypothesis would you test? First, we would test to see if pattern one on the pea bodies, when they localize with the pea granules, like if they're actually interacting, if the pea body is helping the pea granules to silence the mRNA, 
or if maybe the pea granule is helping the pea body do another function. So really looking at the role of those pea bodies. Thank you very much.